Okay, so welcome to the 30th annual Virginia Film Festival. Uh, we have two special guests here who have been kind enough to join us and uh, share their insights and uh, their considerations of two groundbreaking television shows, uh, Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad. Uh, and uh, first is Vince Gilligan, the creator of Breaking Bad and co-creator with Peter Gould of Better Call Saul. And also with us is Mark Johnson, the executive producer of both Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. So welcome to you both. I'm William Little, I'm the host of this conversation. I teach at the University of Virginia in the Department of Media Studies. And I teach a course on Breaking Bad. So, Thank you, uh, William. sorry? Thank you, Thank William. You for having us. Thank you for having us, William. Yeah, our, our and that's pleasure. exciting to teach a course on this thing. Wow. Well, and I, I, I was going to share this later, but my grand plan is to uh, teach a year long course on Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul uh, once the latter has concluded. So um, to be yeah. continued. Wow. Uh, awesome. So again, thank you. Thank you, folks, for, for uh, joining. Um, we really appreciate it. And I think maybe a, a good place to start is, is for the two of you to share the story of your connection uh, at the Virginia Film Festival uh, several years ago. That's several, several years ago is putting it lightly, please. <laughs> what do you think, Mark? <laughs> what, what was it, 88? It was 80, 89. It was 31 years ago this October. Wait a minute, this October, we're in October. 31 yeah. years ago, within a few days, a, a week or so of that, yeah. Wow, we met on stage. Mark was, I don't, I'll let Mark tell his story, but I, I mean, I, the way I remember it was, uh, I was over the moon that I had won. I was one of three winners of the governor's screenwriting competition that year, three unranked winners. And, and we all of us uh, winners got to stand up on stage in Charlottesville, in beautiful Charlottesville and, uh, and, and receive our awards. And uh, Mark Johnson handed me my award in October of 1989, 31 years ago, and sh I shook his hand, and that was when I met him. And then uh, take it from there, Mark. Well, you know what? I realized I never asked you. How did you even know that there was a Governor Governor Wilder, right? A, 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 a screenwriting contest. How did you even know to submit to it? Because you had just graduated from NYU, right? Yeah, I was living in uh, living in. Uh, either Manhattan or Brooklyn at the time. I moved around a little bit, but I just graduated NYU. Uh, this was obviously pre-internet, or if there wasn't internet, only the uh, only the Defense Department had it. But uh, it was, uh, I think my mom, uh, God bless her, she's still around, and she, she uh, um, uh, was reading the uh, Richmond Times Dispatch, I think, probably, back in, uh, back in Virginia, uh, where she lives, and uh, where she still lives, and, and um, sent me a clipping probably from the newspaper saying, you know, you're always looking for these, these screenwriting contests to enter. Uh, and, and here's, here's one in, in, in your home state. And I was very excited to hear about that. And I entered uh, my movie script, my first feature length script, which I'd written as a thesis project for, uh, for NYU for undergrad, NYU undergrad, which is, you know, I got my BFA from, uh, NYU and, uh, and this script called Home Fries was, was one of the three winners that, that year of 1989. And uh, Mark called me up, let's see, we shook hands. That was it, I don't think I talked to you. We just shook hands on stage, but then you called me, you tracked me down and called me in January of 1990. And, and you said, I like that script. You, you had the other. And luckily I'd been working, working hard, working my butt off uh, to write other scripts in the in the interim and so I had more scripts to send you and that's that's how we that's how we officially met I guess that, that's exactly but did you know you knew that you would won right that's why you were in the uh, in the audience that when, in Charlottesville yeah exactly they they told us in advance that we had won um, I might have tried to make it down there regardless but but we we knew in advance we had won uh, and so I, I made the trek down from uh, uh, New York to uh, Charlottesville, and it was just a wonderful. I mean, I have such fond memories. Of it. I've forgotten so much of the last thirty years, but I have very. Uh, I love the Stanley Kubrick expression, non-submergible. Had very non-submergible memories of uh, 
of, of Charlotte's Bay and there in the fall and how, how beautiful it is with the leaves changing. And, and I, I don't know that I'd been to Charlottesville before that, uh, but I don't know that I'd ever spent really any time on the UVA campus and uh, not that I can recall. And uh, it was just a great, great weekend. And, and Jimmy Stewart was there. It was, they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. The, the film festival was celebrating. And I'd forgotten that. It was, it was awesome. It was, uh, I don't think Frank Capra was there, but if he was there, uh, I didn't lay eyes on him, but I, I stood within about, there was a, there was some sort of a, like a cocktail party. And I got to, I stood within about seven feet of Jimmy Stewart and people were nicely, you know, surrounding him and saying hi and well wishing him and saying how much they loved him. And I, I was, I thought I, I, I was in about seven feet of him and I thought, eh, should I, and I, I kind of wimped out and I wish I had uh, uh, shaken his hand. I never, never got to meet Jimmy Stewart, but it was me standing in his presence. It was, uh, it was, uh, and I think he passed away about uh, maybe three years later after that. But uh, what, what a great memory that was. That's great. Uh, I, uh, uh, Vince and I then, I think the next time we met was in New York, right? Didn't we have breakfast or something? And uh, that's right. Were you still living there or did you come up from, uh, did you come up from uh, Richmond? I, I got the phone call from you in January because I was I was taking a long sort of a holiday Christmas and New Year's break and I was hanging out at my mom's house in uh, in Virginia but then uh, and you called me in that January in 1990 but then I uh, took the train back up to, because I lived for about another year in uh, in Brooklyn and before Brooklyn was hip back then Brooklyn was uh, easy to afford uh, right because it, it was not hip but it was it was a, it was fun I enjoyed my year there. But uh, I was looking for work in, in New York after graduation, found uh, jack squat in terms of work, uh, found, found nothing, but uh, that whole year, I think. But luckily, I was in, in good shape because you said, yeah, okay, where are you, you going to be on so and such a date in January or February or March or whatever? And I said, well, I'll, I'll, be, in, I'll be in New York City. So yeah, we had, we had breakfast and it was some fancy hotel uh that you were staying at and and i remember i remember the grapefruit oh i'd forgotten this until just now the grapefruit was something like uh something like twelve dollars for a half of a grapefruit because I, I was looking at the menu so I said, should, I order, should, I, should i order the grapefruit that's insane but i don't know what else to get because i mean if, everything else is even more expensive so i got the grapefruit <laughs> some toast and it was, uh, it was, it was good grapefruit, but it was, yeah, that was when we met. Uh, uh, that was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, um, and so, so we ended up making home, home, home fries, you know, that our friend Dean Pariseau uh, directed it and we made it with, uh, with Drew Barrymore and Luke Wilson and Jake, uh, Jake Busey. It was crazy. Catherine O'Hara. Catherine O'Hara. Oh my God! What it was a it was a wonderful cast. It was a um, yeah. Those are those are great uh, stories. Um, I I I I've been called upon to to um, tease out of you folks sort of consideration of the um, the success and the impact of these two shows, uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. And um, so I I thought uh, you know we could converse a bit about. Um, some of what makes these shows so special, uh, and, and get, congratulations on both um, accomplishments. They they are truly remarkable, and I guess um, I wanted to start by talking about the writing, um, because as as actors and fellow writers and I assume producers as well have said, you know everything begins with the writing, and I actually found a. Um, uh, a quote that I'd like to share. This is from the Better Call Saul podcast, and this is Bob Odenkirk talking. And um, he says the following, uh, Breaking Bad and Saul Goodman was the first time I had a script where every line mattered. Every line paid off. The way the line was structured mattered. And you know, that's why when you ask the writer, because the writer would come to the set about a line, why is it structured this way? I mean, the simplest line, where did I put my hat instead of I can't find my hat? Well, there's an answer as to why I don't say I can't find my hat. 
There's a reason, he says, where did I put my hat? And I'll explain it to you, said the writer. And so it's a challenge. I guess I sensed pretty quickly that there's a subtext to everything and there's things being laid down that pay off later and echo later. Wow. I'm wondering, yes. yeah, I, I thought that was terrific uh, and I couldn't agree more. I think the writing is incredibly nuanced and subtle and I'm wondering um, if you want to amplify that at all. <clears throat> well, I have to start by saying I'm, I don't remember uh, uh, Saul Goodman ever wearing a hat. So I, I think uh, <laughs> he's what a sweet guy. That that is wow. That is flattering stuff. I think uh, I don't. I, I, God bless him. I, I, I there were probably uh, many instances where you know it's interesting. I, I I just I don't even know what to say. I never heard that quote. It's uh it's it's very flattering. God bless him. Um, we do take the script. Uh, very seriously, and it. I, you know, I want to start off uh, with him by saying it's a, it's a, it's a uh, definitely a group effort. That uh, the only episode of of either of these two, we're going to have. I think we're going to have 125 episodes, uh, counting both shows as as one universe. We're going to have 125 episodes when we're done uh, between Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, and only one of them was written by one person, and that was the pilot of Breaking Bad. And I'm proud of it. Don't don't get me wrong, but in a in a very real sense, it's the weakest episode of the 125 because it went through only one person's brain, so to speak, during the structuring of it. And uh, this thing is a group effort, and we as 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 a group, we writers take take the structure very very seriously, and and structure. The bones, the skeleton, the the, the the you know the the, the gurs that hold up the uh, you know the Brooklyn Bridge, yes, so to speak. If you think in terms of structure, structure is is desperately important. Important, or else your bridge falls down, your Empire State Building falls down. Structure uh, leads to, to 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 everything else. Uh, and yet, having said that, the structure itself is 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 uh, is illuminated to the writers by the character characters plural that they're writing about. So everything starts from character. But then character begets structure, and structure begets dialogue the way we see it. Having said all of that, I don't consider myself particularly precious about the dialogue that I write. I do tend to um, sweat over it, try to come up with the best terms of phrase. And, 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 and as, as, as Bob said, every sentence should mean something. Definitely, every scene should should mean something, move the plot forward. But but in terms of, I've heard stories about writers who will argue vehemently with an actor. You know, I I, I don't want an and there. I want a the there. I want. I I don't think it's healthy to be that precious about it. It's funny to hear Bob say that because I don't consider ourselves that precious about it all the time when I'm directing or or even if not directing, if I happen to be visiting the set. Uh, as a courtesy, even when I'm not directing, our script supervisor will come up to me after take and say, you know, uh, they said this line wrong and they missed this sentence entirely and they put this word in front of that word. And I say, really? And they say, yeah, should we tell them to get it right? I'm like, nah, it's whatever, it's close enough. I mean, if it sounds like real human beings conversing, if it doesn't sound fake, if it doesn't sound like acting, in other words, uh, you know, uh, I'm not, I don't get that hung up. I don't think any of us writers on the, on the show, on either show, get that hung up about the dialogue, unless it's a very specific line that if it's not said just right, we'll screw up something five episodes later, but those are very few and far between. Having said that, very flattering, very flattering that it, we come across that way to him. And I'm gonna start writing in more hats for him to wear. <laughs> I, I, I take your point. I do wonder if there are certain points, though, in, in a script where the texture of the language, the, the, the word choices are significant. And by the way, I'm thinking, and I'm, I'm not uh, seeking, um, you know, uh, approval from you that this was a conscious decision, but I find it kind of resonant that the, the uh, title sequence to Breaking Bad actually kind of makes graphic the elemental aspects of words. I mean, they, it, it, it foregrounds language in, in, from the very beginning, <laughs> so to speak. Um, so that, that those are those are they're building blocks, really, um, and everything kind of comes from there. 
Well, and I love the way you put that. I hadn't thought of it that way. The periodic table with all its, uh, with the, you know, with the alphabet and the, and you know, all the different uh, chemical uh, elements and whatnot. That, that's very interesting that you put it that way. But you know, it, it, it's not not to not to argue that because I, I love that. I had never thought of that. I love that interpretation. But to me, writing, and this is why I'm a movie writer and TV writer. I, I use those words interchangeably. TV, movies. It's all it's all visual storytelling. I. To me, it's about what you're seeing happen. And I love words, I love dialogue. I love, I mean, I'll watch just off the top of my head, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the, the movie version of it. I've seen it probably, I don't know, 20, 20 times. I love the language. I love, uh, you know, man, it's language. I love, I love the words, but it's, that's, that's very much a play turned into a movie and, and done, done so very artfully, very visually. The director added a lot of value visually. I love stuff like that. I love the words in uh, the dialogue in Sweet Smell of Success. I could have seen that dozens of times. I, words are important and the words we say are important, but as more and more we realize, you know, as, as life goes on and as 2020 goes on, the words that come out of people's mouths are not necessarily the truth and they don't necessarily represent reality. And this is a lesson to be learned in, in, in fiction as well as, as in real life. People very often, even with the best of intentions, say the opposite of what they mean. So you know, your word choice is important, especially when you think, well, you know, our, my character should, is saying one thing, but they're really doing another. But to me, it's all about the writing. It's, it's again, it's that idea of structure, structure derived from character, but, uh, my favorite moments in any filmed entertainment I've ever seen, any TV show, any movie, are, are the, and I know you're going to ask me which ones, and I'm going to draw a blank, but I mean the visual moments, sure. the, the moments without words are the most important, and those are our favorite moments. It is our favorite times in the writer's room and in the editing room when we distill a scene down to, to no words at all, to just what people are doing, a look one character gives to another. Peter Gould, my partner on, on, on Better Call Saul, who created the character of Saul Goodman. I'll never forget this story. I've, I've told it before. It's worth retelling. We were in the editing room one time, or actually he was in the editing room and he came into my office and he looked giddy. And I said, what's up? He said, you know, that big scene with all that talk, all that dialogue between, you know, I can't even remember which scene it was. It was in Better Call Saul. Might actually have been in Breaking Bad, but he said, he said, remember that big scene with all the words? I figured out a way to cut all the talking out of that scene. Yeah. Or yeah. 90% of it. And, and that was, he was so excited as a writer. And this is counterintuitive because us writers were known for, oh, we, we always make the joke, our, 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 our words are golden pearls, you know, which is terrible writing, golden pearls, you know. <laughs> but uh, our, our, our words are golden pearls. Uh, we, you know, each one is, is invaluable. We hate writers like that. <laughs> writers, are, if we can cut an enormous swath of dialogue out of something and it works better without it, that is showmanship. That is cinema. That is true storytelling, and the rest of it is just words. And and uh, and words are important, but the most important moments in life are are, are sans words. We believe, and we'll cut them out any chance we get. We'll cut the dialogue any chance we get. Yeah, this is weird for a show about a guy who uses his mouth as his main weapon. I'm sorry, I keep speaking of words. I, I, I'm i talking about a dearth of words and here I am rambling on. Sorry about that. Two, two <laughs> thoughts about that. One is I think that the scene you might be referencing, it's a terrific scene in Better Call Saul is when um, Jimmy's just uh, learned that he's earned his degree and he goes to celebrate down in the mail room and then Howard comes to <laughs> celebrate with him but comes to bring news and the whole thing is shot outside that room and you don't hear what they're saying it's very powerful i think that was a good one yeah that was a good one was tricky about that one. Oh man i think that was yes and that might well have been uh, uh, exactly right that might have been it the, the thing the painful part of that scene was the director shot it without the glass, uh, without the plate glass in place. The, he had the production designer and the, and the crew move the piece of glass out, the window out, because he was seeing his own reflection. And, and he figured no one would notice. And of course we noticed. So we had to digitally create reflections. We had to digitally create a sheet of glass for this long scene 
that was maybe the most expensive effect shot in the entire history of uh, the series. So that was, <laughs> we weren't happy about that. <laughs> William, one of, the, one of the things that Vince does that a lot of shows don't do is he makes sure that the writer of each individual episode, he makes sure that she or he is on the set the entire time it's being shot just to protect the script. Not necessarily, as Vince says, protect the words, but protect the script and make sure that those sort of touchstones, those important plot or character moments certainly are still achieved. That's great. That's a good point. That's a, what Mark says, a good point. I'm glad, I'm glad you said that, Mark. And it, and but that's not something I invented. That was something I learned from Chris Carter, my boss on uh, my first TV show, uh, The X Files. He would send us writers to Vancouver back. That was back in the early days. We're shooting in Vancouver, and uh, and he wanted he wanted an advocate on the set for the script. And in his and in his mind too, it wasn't about getting all the words right. It was about getting the theme and the point of it all across. Because it's very easy to forget the point of any given scene. Every scene, I mean, you know, writing 101, every scene, every directing 101, acting 101 as well, every scene in any TV show, any movie has to have a point. And if you miss the point of it, then what was, then, you know, then what was the point of all the money and time you're spending? So he was good that way. And I, and I continue that with uh, Breaking Bad. And Peter continues that with Better Call Saul. Yeah. But you know, Vince, a lot of shows don't do that. And I've even had uh, different uh, showrunners tell me, well, we can't afford it. Meaning to send the, you know, fly a, uh, the writer to the set and put her or him up for however long. And it's like, it seems to me like the worst, worst way of not spending money. Oh, you can't afford not to, I think. I mean, it's penny wise and pound foolish. But, but I haven't said that. I don't want to, I mean, the beauty of this, one of the many beauties of this job is that there's no one right way to do it. Uh, whatever works for you as a showrunner, whatever works for you as a, as a you know, whatever works is whatever works. So, uh, and, and there's not just one way, but, but the way we like to do it, we like having an advocate on this. It's not even about being an advocate. That sounds almost adversarial. That, that's probably the wrong choice of words. It's not about, oh, they're all trying to ruin our golden pearls. You know, it's not that. It's just that people, you're moving very fast because, you know, it's like, it's like the, uh, it's worse than any, it's like the worst gas pump in the world when you're watching the gas pump and you're filling your car up and the, you know, the, the money is racking yeah. up. It's, it's that times 10, times a hundred, times a thousand, you know, and the, the seconds are going by and the money is being spent. So you, you need someone there who's not in, immediately engaged in the process of making the movie, making the show who can sit there and think, oh crap, we're missing something. And that's what it's about. It's about being helpful. It's about being value added. You know, I want, um, uh, thank you for all that. I, I wanna actually go back and pick up on something you were saying earlier about language and uh, the, the, the inherent sort of uh, potential for deception and, um, you know, the slipperiness of language. And it, it, it strikes me, and we don't need to linger over this too long, that that's really one of the key motifs, if you will, in uh, Better Call Saul, that, uh, you know, Jimmy really it has has command of language in a way. He's, he, he's a, quite an orator, um, but it, it, he can he can spin too, right? I mean, you know, he's got the, he, he's got the makeup of a, a televangelist and a con man, and, you know, he can, he, he can, he can work some magic with words. And that's terribly unsettling to Chuck. I mean, I think that that's one explanation for Chuck being in quarantine, <laughs> that he's just, he's somewhat freaked out by, by the, uh, the slipperiness of Jimmy's language. You know, I mean, Jimmy's an electric figure, right? That's, that's part of what's- yeah. <laughs> no, they, Good point, good point. They really, it, it, they were, what an interesting relationship that turned out to be, uh, and, and uh, I mean that the, the 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 world's most honest lawyer, most upright lawyer, who actually himself is has a bit of the con man genome, and uh, Chuck does, but but he sees himself as 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 uh, you know the reincarnation of John Marshall or, or whatnot. He's, he's he's upright, he's upstanding, and he's and he's hates the way his brother abuses the law, but he mainly hates that his brother's a lawyer because that's his that's his world, that's his 
it, it, they're fascinating characters. And you know, it's an interesting thing, fascinating thing for me is that we didn't know this. This is what I love about the group effort of making television. And again, it is their shows, you don't have to do anything the way we do it. There's, there's shows written by one writer, one, 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 one person. But the way we do it, a bunch of us in a room, it's an additive value. All these great minds, all these smart people, Peter and I have hired in this room. Chuck and Jimmy, that great relationship at the heart of, of, of the early seasons of Better Call Saul that, that really makes Jimmy McGill who he is. That none of that existed in the pilot episode that uh, that uh, uh, Peter and I wrote together. It was it was a group mind product uh, uh, that came of spending months and months together in this writers' room. In the original the original idea Peter and I had in that pilot episode when Chuck appears, yeah, he's quarantined in his house because he's got this uh, this uh, uh, allergy to electricity, uh, and and he was going to be the uh, uh, Mycroft Holmes of the show, uh, in a sense, he was the more brilliant. He was Sherlock Holmes's more brilliant brother, uh, and he was gonna, he was gonna be very upstanding morally, and yet he was gonna do things. He's gonna, you know, the way lawyers can do. He's gonna say, "Well, you shouldn't do this," but if I were to do something like this, if someone were, if a lawyer were to do something like this, hypothetically speaking, you could do this and you could do that, and Jimmy would take his legal advice. And then mixed with Jimmy's gift for gab mm -hmm. and showmanship and, and, and his ability to con and use his mouth, the two of them together would make the one part of lawyer. That was the original idea. And then it morphed into this whole other thing that was a hundred times more fascinating. This terribly sad relationship between these two brothers. And that didn't exist at the beginning. Well, I did. I want to. Um, I, I uh, pardon me for doing this, but I want. I want to quote you from from the podcast uh, to talk about. So we, we talk somewhat about the complexity of language, and 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 that's connected to the complexity of character. Um, and one of the things that I so admire about both shows is that the renderings of at least the primary characters are so nuanced and patient and um, shaded uh, that that you know, a viewer can view and review uh, each character study, if you will, endlessly, um, that no character is exhaustible. And, and, and this is you, um, it, it, I think you're speaking to Peter and, and, and the writer of uh, uh, an episode. You say, it's such a complicated thing you guys have woven. I tell you, this show, Better Call Saul, could be taught in a psych class in college. <laughs> and and uh, you know it makes a professor happy to hear that, of course. <laughs> uh, but I do I do just um, uh, wonder at uh, the the kind of naughtiness, you know, K N O T T I, N E S S, the naughtiness and the um, sort of multifaceted um, nature of each of the um, primary characters and. Uh, you know, they, in some ways, at times, the characters bleed into each other. I mean, Chuck and Jimmy, in some ways, aren't all that different. Uh, yeah. Or, you, you know, or it's Walt and Gus, or um, even maybe at times, uh, well, I think Walter and um, uh, Marie have some, some things in common in terms of their own desires, ambitions, if you will. Uh, and I love the fact that characters bleed into each other. And, and then they're also... Um, and, and forgive me for, for going on a bit here, but uh, they are also in many ways haunted by uh, their pasts. And I love the way you guys integrate their pasts in very subtle ways. You don't hit us over the head with flashbacks to, hey, this explains everything. Um, the, the flashbacks are woven in, in in very subtle ways, as is, of course, the, the flash forwards in, in Better Call Saul are just terrific. Some of my favorite parts of the show. Um, yeah, so, this, so anyway, each character is really a, a multiple self. Um, and I, I don't have a particular question there other than just to, I think, try to help explain um, why, why the show is, uh, for, among many other reasons, have received such acclaim. Um, that is so flattering, William. I, 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 uh, wow, I, uh, man, my, my head is like grew two sizes just then. Um, I, I, uh, um, and, I'm very happy to feel that way about it because we work hard to, we try to, we always use the expression, we try to use every bit of the buffalo. So, so we, we, uh, we try to, uh, we always have going back to 
Breaking Bad, we, we realize I'm a fan of television. I, I grew up watching so much TV, way more than I should have. Uh, and as much as I love TV, and this is some old, old school TV, and I think I've said this before somewhere, but it, it, it probably bears repeating it. Old school television was about maintaining the franchise. It was about keeping people tuning in every week. And there, there was a, there used to be a saying with TV and maybe it still holds in some circles, but you remake the pilot over and over again. You know, the pilot episode gives you the thesis or the premise, you know, it introduces you to the characters and it tells you, you know, what the franchise is, what the show's about. And then you just basically remake that. And that was when television was more episodic and TV was episodic because, uh, this was in a time before VCR, definitely before streaming, definitely before being able to type in and say, oh, I want to watch this episode of this show, but it was even before VCRs. And if you missed an episode of TV, you just plain missed it. And most people, even fans of a, self-described fans of a show, saw one in four episodes of that show. So you had to be episodic back then. Serialized shows were, when I started, were just basically verboten. You couldn't do it. But things started to change around the time that uh, we were ready to make Breaking Bad. And, and this long-winded answer boils down to this. Everything you just described is stuff that we looked around and didn't really see anybody else doing at that time. So we figured, why, let's, let's, let's do something no one else on the face of it seems to be doing. And, and it started really as simply as that, which I think is a great philosophy for not just you know TV showrunners, but people designing cars or people, you know, whatever, any, any anything, anything and everything, any any line of human endeavor uh, I can think of. It's a good thing to look around and see what everybody else is doing, and then and then not just reflexively go the other direction just for the hell of it, but just you know what what can what can we do different that would be interesting that would improve things, and that that's where it all started. But then we started to realize. You know, our, t our thought originally was, well, we, as the show progresses, as the universe, as so to speak, grows, we'll add more characters and then we'll have more characters to, to learn about. And we, we certainly did that. The, the, the number of characters grew as, as, as they must as, as the years and the episodes progress. But we realized, you know, these characters that we're building the show around, the core characters, they, they can be, the more we learn about them, the more fascinated we are. And so let's mine them to the nth degree. Let's learn everything we can about them because instead of just throwing new characters into the mix, because these guys are fascinating and they, they became more well-rounded, they became more complex. And by the way, and you know, this all started too by hiring the best actors out there. Every actor, every core actor, every, especially the core group of actors in Breaking Bad and now on Better Call Saul are so damn good. They are so they're, they're up for anything we throw at them. They're, they can do anything. And, and so the more complex we make these characters, sometimes the complex, complexities come from watching these actors and realizing, you know, there's a little, there's a little ingredient that they're doing here that we can put into the writing. Uh, and we, it's just so much fun doing that. But that's, that's where it all stemmed from, I think. Yeah, and I mean, I'm, I'm sort of uh, amplifying or reiterating what you're saying. There, there's nothing schematic about any of the, um, the core uh, characters in either show. And um, I love that there was an exchange you and Peter had again in the podcast where uh, Peter said, I love a scene where all the characters are right. And you said, yeah, those are my favorite. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, and it kind of, th that, that kind of um, characterization and that kind of script writing um, they lend themselves then to continual reviewing of of the the, the material, um, and I again I just I, I applaud that because I, I think it just it just deepens one's one's appreciation one's understanding of these characters. Um, they deepen on on each reviewing, and I, I you know in thinking about uh, preparing for this, I was struck by a. Um, a, uh, an exchange in Breaking Bad that might be almost a kind of um, uh, manual for how to view these shows. Um, because I really do think, and I, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, so you tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I see both shows as both, you know, popular entertainments and really, and, and works of art. 
really almost pieces of, of literature um, because they are so subtle and carefully crafted. And, um, and one can go either way with that. Um, you, can, you, can, you can enter at, at, at any point. Um, but I'm really struck by an, an exchange that took place between Jesse and Jane in Breaking Bad when they go to the museum in Santa Fe. And, you know, uh, Jesse says, what are we doing here? You know, a door's a door. George O'Keefe painted all these doors. Uh, and um, yeah, Jesse says, why would anyone paint a picture of a door over and over again, like dozens of times? And Jane says, but it wasn't the same one. Jesse, yeah, it was. Jane, it was the same subject, but it was different every time. The light was different. Her mood was different. And, I, I, you know, I, I just can't help but hear that, that that's really an invitation as a way to read these shows. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, I, 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 I just, uh, I, that, all I can tell you is that was a good day in the writer. I, 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 I'm, this is very flattering. Uh, that was a great day in the writer's room. And again, I, I, the best thing I feel like I could do on this call is, is, is reinforce the idea that this was a group effort. Uh, that was a great day in the writer's room when we came up with that scene. And I'd love to sit here and say, oh yeah, that was one of mine. I walked into the room that day and I said, you know, I had a thought about it. what's that old expression, you know, no man ever steps into the same stream twice, you know, is there some way we can turn that into, I, that was either uh, Moira Wally Beckett, or maybe that was, you know, I don't even want to, I can't even remember who, this is the beauty of work, of the, of the way, and, and again, work any way you want, if you're watching this, and you're saying, well, I'm a showrunner, and I do it this way, or if you're watching, you say, I want to be a showrunner, and I want to, I want to write every episode myself, more power to you, uh, you know, if it works, it works, but those, I love the way you put that, and I couldn't be more proud of it uh, if it were my own. And it, in a sense, we're all working together, so there's a hive mind going. But somebody else had that thought, uh, and I wasn't even aware, I think, at that point that George O'Keefe did a series of hmm. doors. So that was definitely some other writer in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I love... I love the, the highest praise for for any TV show I can think of is that you want to, or any movie is that you'd want to rewatch it over and over again. And that is what we strive for. I'm so glad to hear that, that, that it, it accomplishes that for you because uh, uh, I, I just, that's the highest, you know, you want that, you want your work to live to, to, to survive you and you want people to watch it more than once. And uh uh, that's uh, I don't know, Mark. This is this is. You didn't tell me I was gonna I was gonna get so. Uh, I was uh, this. I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, this is this is like the best uh, hour ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I'll I'll just uh, one more. Way. <laughs> one more way of uh, William. What do you not like about Better Call Saul or uh, or or or? or, 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 or <laughs> yeah. I had a quick question for Vince, and I, I realize I never asked this. What did you learn? Because you must, there must have been something in the, uh, something in the air when you were on the X Files. What did you learn from that? That 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 sort of informs on everything else you've done, or maybe maybe all of it. I, I uh, uh, the, the X Files was a. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul have to be the, the, the zenith. They have to be the best job just because it's just, you know, but X-Files was a damn close second because uh, it, what a great job that was and what a great show that was. I started off as a fan and the simple answer is I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here if Mark Johnson hadn't, uh, and, and if not for the Virginia Film Festival and the governor's screenwriting uh, competition and, uh, and Mark uh, uh, and the other judges, uh, and Mark calling me afterward. But I also wouldn't be here if it weren't for the X-Files because it taught me how to produce. It taught me how to, I was already a writer, but I, I, could, I could say, honestly, it taught me how to write as well because I, I, my, my sheer volume of output increased a hundredfold when I suddenly was writing for TV. I was, Mark can tell you, I was the laziest bastard I ever lived the, the first five years I was working with him. I was living in uh, I was living in Powhatan County, Virginia, uh, not too far east of Charlottesville, uh, a little bit southeast. And I uh, was just farting around all day, not not getting anything done. And I needed the uh, 
I wasn't a self-starter and I needed the discipline uh, that TV imposes upon a writer and the X-Files imposed it upon me. And uh, uh, I learned how to write, I learned how to direct. I started directing on the X-Files uh, and I learned how to produce TV and, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, Brave and Bad wouldn't have lasted. I wouldn't have gotten anywhere with that if I didn't, not for all the things uh, I learned on the X-Files for seven years on that show that held me in good stead. The reason I asked Vince is I talked, as you know, I, I, I produced a movie for David Chase and David Chase told me the best job he's ever had was Rockford, the Rockford Files. And I've been recently watching it and there is so much of the Sopranos set up in his episodes of the Rockford Files. And nevertheless, it's still, it's still that show. Rockford Files is a great show. James Garner was fantastic. It was very, so well written. I mean, just from the title sequence with uh, with the uh, the uh, uh, answering machine every week and the different message, the different incoming message every week. Uh, and then I guess uh, answering machines were pretty new back when, then when they shot that. It was kind of a novelty. But God, what a what a great! And then the photos and the great uh, the great uh, was it the great Mike Post music. Uh, I met Mike Post by the way. What a character! He what a cool guy. Uh, but God, what a great show that is! That you knew from the opening frames of that show that it was going to be a classic, and I'll bet he, I bet he did learn a lot. And he, I mean, there's two wonderful shows. He is uh, 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 hugely uh, 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 responsible for, you know, The Sopranos and and Rockford, Night Stalker too. He wrote a lot of Night Stalkers. So that was a good one. I love the Night Stalker. So uh, Vince, um, I hope you don't mind if, if I try to um, put both of these shows in uh, some kind of cultural context um, that I, that I uh, work through with you the possibility that, that both shows in some ways reflect the, the, the moment in which they're made. Um, and, uh, you know, both shows are pretty dark, right? In some ways, there, there are comedic elements and that's very valuable and, and wonderful. Um, but I, I'd say that in some ways, and again, I, I want to hear from you, of course, on this, that, that both uh, worlds are, are marked by a kind of dearth or absence of social cohesion and robust uh, civic engagement um, mm. that, that, you know, when you think about it, um, there are very few scenes where there are kind of large gatherings of people who are celebrating a kind of, you know, in a ritual way. It's, it's usually you know, a family unit or two people like Kim and Jimmy. Um, and so I, I, I can't help but feel that, that both shows are sort of marked by a, a sense of uh, isolation uh, and, and even loneliness at times. That's particularly true of Better Call Saul. You know, think of Mike in the ticket booth or um, yeah. Jimmy in the back of the nail salon. And um, yeah, and I just, um, I wonder what you make of that. You know, it's it's uh, you're exactly right. It, it uh, when you it's uh, and I, by the way, I love I love talking to 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 uh, smart people who who love my work because uh, very smart people because uh, I learn things about it that I. It's amazing what a, a filmmaker or writer doesn't know about their own work. It, it you could fill volumes. With with what they don't know, and it, and and, it, and in the face of it, it sounds like oh, I mean, it's, it's this guy's being aw shucks. He's being an aw. This is an aw shucks moment. It's a false modesty. There are. It's interesting. There are always. I feel like very mechanical, very mundane reasons that for it, for things like that, uh, and yet they all maybe hang together as a motif or, or an idiom or something. But I. In the case of uh, you know Mike alone in the booth, he is a solitary guy, and I guess we were trying to evoke that. But it just this booth was just this great location that we could get for cheap, because <laughs> uh, the city of Albuquerque, God bless them, it was on city property, and they uh, they've been great to us. Albuquerque has been stellar to us, the city and the people. But uh, and we you know we're we're thinking of Nighthawks, the great Edward Hopper painting. I was we're just thinking gonna <laughs> I was just going to say that there's so there's so I, there's a lot of Edward Hopper in Better Call Saul. I really yeah. 
You're mm -hmm. right, there is. And actually, I love Edward Hopper, but uh, my partner in the show, Peter Gould, is uh, his parents both were painters in New York City in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And uh, his father uh, very sadly passed away, I think, uh, just before Peter was born. But his father was an excellent painter. And you see his father's painting, one of his father's paintings, uh, at the end of every episode of Better Call Saul, it says, uh, it says, uh, oh, shoot, what's the name of his, his uh, uh, what's the, uh, Mark, help me out, the name of the, his production company is, is something diner. Uh, it, when you see a, a guy in a diner and uh, what the hell, I'm embarrassed now. I can't think of Peter's uh, company name, but uh, Crystal, Crystal Diner, Crystal Diner. And um, it says, when it says Crystal Diner at the end of the episode, it says uh, High Bridge, which is my company. And it says Grown Via, which is Mark's company. And then it says Crystal Diner. And there's this, this wonderful, very Hopper-esque painting of a guy in a diner, except not Hopper-esque. He was, uh, uh, because Peter's dad really was his own And that's artist. from Peter's dad? Peter's dad painted that before Peter was born. Yeah, and it, uh, and it, it means it has great meaning to Peter and it, uh, but there was his, his, and his mother is an excellent uh, painter as well. Uh, and, uh, and she's still around. And, uh, but they, they, he grew up, he was brought up in a very artistic family. I, I shouldn't speak for Peter. Peter should uh, do your show sometime. He'd be, he's uh, he'd, uh, not, if you want to show but do your, do your uh, thing here. Anytime. Because he, uh, he could, he could explain a lot more of this, but he, I kind of got off on a tangent, but his parents being artists and being, uh, well, they weren't contemporary with Hopper, but you know, that whole art world in New York back in the, you know, back then and, Hopper was way before them, but but at any rate, uh, yeah, that that there's a certain I don't even know if I have a point here, except that there is a certain loneliness uh, with with these characters. Uh, I agree, but also sometimes it comes down to simple physical things like sure. crowds of people are hard to hard to hard to put together and hard to manage. And and you know, what would you as a director? And, and Peter and I direct a lot. We try to as direct as often as we can. As a director. As a lazy director, particularly, what would you rather have one or two really excellent actors who you know are not going to give you any trouble, or a whole crowd of extras uh, that are going to that are going to wind up? At least one of them is always going to wind up staring right into the lens that you're going to have to cut around. You know, what would you rather? <laughs> what would you rather write for when you know that you're going to be directing it? Uh, but sometimes it comes down to things as simple and quotidian as that. Because I don't want to, I don't want a big, I don't have the, I don't have the energy to deal with a big crowd scene today. Let's keep it simple. Well, I, I think there's a kind of fortuitousness in that because I do think the, the, um, the uh, isolation um, and disconnection that you see um, in both shows is connected to something that I, I can't help but notice that runs through both shows, and that is. Um, what to call it, a, a kind of um, class disparity and class anxiety. I think both shows uh, uh, um, have a lot to do with social class. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's the white family. And of course, there's a racial component to this too, which maybe we don't have time to get into, but the white family is in some ways clinging to a kind of middle class uh, status. Um, they're concerned about losing their home. They've got bills to pay. Now Walter's sick. Um, and I think I think that class anxiety is there with J with uh, Jimmy too. You know that he, he sees his brother having attained a certain station in life, and at, at some level he aspires to that. Um, but he's also put off by a certain kind of elitism that's there in, in Howard. And um, so I, you know, I think I, in in that sense, for me anyway, the the, the shows do resonate as a commentary on um, class uh resentments and class conflicts um that are very much you know present i i, I wouldn't i wouldn't argue with that i um uh, yeah i i i will say I, I think all that stuff is there and i and i and i i uh and i would i would i would i would agree with that point reinforce that point but i would also add that it's it's with us first and foremost we we try not to be too thematic, I guess is a word. We try not to, we, we, all of those kind of things as, as ingredients, we're all for it. But 
we try not to be, uh, you know, first and foremost, come up with an interesting character and tell his or her story uh, in, as, in as realistic and honest a fashion as possible. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the great truths is, you know, of drama, drama at its heart is about somebody wanting something that they can't have and uh, everybody or that they have a hard time obtaining. And then the best dramas are, then they obtain it and then they realize it's not even what they wanted and then they want something else. That's the, that's the eternal human condition. That's been going on for 3 million years plus. And uh, so, you know, what can everybody relate to? I guess what I'm trying to say is I agree with everything you just said. I'm, I'm not disagreeing. But sometimes these things derive not so much from a sense of, uh, gee, I've, I, I really want to tell, I really want to make an important point about society. Sometimes mm -hmm. they just come from, uh, you know, what can everybody relate to? And everybody, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, I mean, I don't know, it's one of those things everybody can relate to. I'm, I'm at a place, I want to be in a different place. I'm having a hard time getting to that place. And if you'd make it more existential, like, like we did with Breaking Bad, uh, this guy, he's scraping by, he's got two jobs. He's a high school teacher and he's a damn good one. But sometimes the kids aren't really listening. So sometimes it's all these, all these pearls of wisdom are just, you know, being wasted. But then he's got the uh, afternoon job at the, at the car wash just to make ends meet. But I don't think you're supposed to feel sorry for him or anything. It's just, it's just uh, until it find, you find out on top of everything else, he's got cancer. And then that awakens things in him and, and we can all relate. Uh, if you know, God forbid, no, most of us most of us can't relate to. Oh God, I just got a terrible terminal diagnosis. But we can all very quickly comprehend what that would feel like and sympathize with it. And but having said that, you know these themes. I think they're. I always feel like the themes are best mined by by smart people such as such as yourself and uh, and and your and your students. And uh, it you, I'm always amazed when I talk to people who created shows or movies that, that I, that I, that I respond to and that mean something to me, I, I'm always amazed at <laughs> all my favorite moments that just turned out to be happenstance and, 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 uh, and just turned out to be, uh, you know, not saying no thought goes into it because that would be a lie, but I mean, some of the, some of my favorite moments are just, uh, you know, well, it's, you know, the actor wasn't available that day or, or, or the, somebody broke their hand, and so we couldn't. You know, we did this instead. So, but not not to not to art, not to. You know, yeah, no, know. and it's a, it, it's a kind of um, uh, recognition or appreciation of the fact that an artist is never fully conscious of or in control of all the different permutations and implications of the work. Right? It's much more goes on than one can possibly understand. Right? Yes, I agree one thousand percent with that statement, and I. Don't even think, I'd go a step further and say something I kind of said a second ago. I, I don't even think it's the artist's job uh, to 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 explain to the world what what their art is about. I mean, we every attempt I make, it just sounds pompous or it sounds just plain stupid. Or I, I think it's for other people. I mean, it's not even art. And, you know, there's a whole philosophical you know tree falls in the forest thing. That, if you create, I think about this a lot, I always have, you know, if you create art, I'm using the word art, and it sounds, even that sounds a little highfalutin, but let's call it art. But, uh, uh, you know, you create something, you, you, you paint a painting, or you write a script, and is it still art if you then take that painting or that script and put it in your closet and don't allow any, anyone to see it? I'd like to think it is. I'd like to, I'd like to, I actually be very pleased with the idea of a, of, a, of a world of art where you create simply for the satisfaction it gives you. But then I think, is it really, you know, you know, is there a whole component to, then you have to give it to the world and the world has to make their judgment and, and maybe judgment, uh, judgment's one word, but they have to explain to you what it is you made. There's something I love about that idea. And yeah, I agree. I, I'd be the, I'm, I'm always the worst person to ask about. And it's not false modesty or anything. I'm just, I just don't think that way. It's just, I'm the worst person to ask as to what the deeper meanings of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul are. I just, I just, make the I just have yeah. to make the difference. It's, it's for folks 
like yourself and your students uh, and, 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 and anyone who is um, blessed to have as a fan, we're blessed to have as fans, it's for them to figure out what it all means. It's theirs in a weird way as much as it is ours. D.H. Lawrence said, you know, never trust the uh, teller, never trust the artist, trust, you know, trust the work. That's well put. Yeah, that's a great, that's a good one. Yeah, I agree. And I, do, I, I take seriously the value of, of putting it out into the world and then being able to share, you know, that, that the, the, the value is in being able to share it and, and talk about it and think about it, reflect on it. Um, and to, to weave that back into the show for a second, one of the really, I think, you know, more, more uplifting uh, threads in the show is uh, in this world of isolation and disconnection, one way that Jimmy continually tries to make connection with people is through movies. He, yeah. he, he, has, he, he likes to talk about movies and he likes to watch movies. <laughs> um, and I just, I, I really, I don't you want to add to that, but it's... Uh, I agree, yeah. and, and I, I mean, yes, it does. And, and we, we love movies. We, we, the people in the writer's room, love movies. And, and I think it all started with, it was a throwaway line in the, in the first, uh, in the episode of Breaking Bad that Saul Goodman first appeared, which was entitled Better Call Saul. And it was episode seven or eight of season two, I think. By the way, I'm the worst person to like, remember what episode was which. But Peter Gould wrote that episode and there's a throwaway line where he's talking a mile a minute to the character of Badger who he is representing uh, for, a, for selling uh, meth. And he, and he says, I need a check made to my loan out company, uh, 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 Ice Station Zebra Associates. We just, it was just a complete lark, a complete throwaway. But then when we said, hey, we're gonna do a show, let's do a show, a spinoff called Better Call Saul. We, this is again using every bit of the buffalo and mining those things. We thought, why would this loan out company be called Ice Station Zebra Associates? And we had a scene where the love of his life, Kim Wexler, uh, and he watch Ice Station Zebra. Uh, and I think they even talk about it before they watch it, but it was her dad's favorite movie. And this is how this, this wonderful stuff derives. It, it, this is where it comes from you look back, if you allow yourself to, you look back and say, when the hell did that mean? Because it, it literally was a, a BS kind of a throwaway line uh, when, when, when it came up in, in Breaking Bad. And then suddenly, you know, they're watching Ice Station Zebra. You know what? And we enjoy watching them watch a movie. So let's do that again this season. And now they're watching some other movie. They're watching, and it just, it's an organic thing that allows as writers, we, and this is why I love being in a room with smart people, because, and you can do that, one person could do this too, I suppose. I, I'm not sure I could, but somebody could, but you're always going to get, there's going to be ingredients put into your, into your stone soup here, into, into your, into your, into your stew, ingredients that you would have never thought to use. And it's, you know, if you curate it all well, and you, everyone's pulling the rope in the same direction, and so to speak, it, it becomes, there's an additive effect. It's synergistic. It, it becomes more than you ever could have done by yourself. But, but uh, I, you know, something I want to say, William, about, because I, I love that conversation we had a minute ago about what is art and is it the same if you don't share it with the world? And I, I want to offer to anyone listening one quick thought, which is don't ever think it ever gets easier sharing it with the world. Uh, somebody watching this who wants to do this for a living or is attempting, you know, learning to do this for a living in your class or whatever, probably thinking, well, you know, this guy's, you know, this guy's, okay, the guys have done two TV shows already and they've been, thank God, they've been well received. So then it gets easier. Then you write something new. Oh, here you go, world. I think you're going to be very happy with this. It never gets easier. The sharing it with the world is maybe the hardest part. And it's the part where it's the part that makes us gives us writer's block sometimes. And it's the part that writing should be the easiest job in the world because you're sitting around making up ideas. And it's not it's not like digging a ditch in 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 90 degree heat. You know, it's it's you're sitting in a comfortable chair and you got your music playing and you got your your coffee and it's like it should be the greatest job in the world, but it's miserable at least for me, because I know at some point I got to share it with the world. And that's the hard part because then you're, you know, oh my God, they're going to hate it. But I, I just wanted to say that for anyone thinking, 
the good news is the good news is the people who have succeeded are just as scared as you are. The bad news is it never gets easier. So, <laughs> Thank uh, you for the advice. Yes, I just to say that because people always think, well, you know, there's a trick to it. There's a secret to it. The secret is to have yourself lobotomized in whatever portion of the brain fear resides so that you don't worry about it ever again. But I wouldn't recommend that. That's not a good plan. <laughs> so it never gets easier? No. No, never. I'm working on something now. I mean, we're working uh, Better Call Saul now. We're working in the final season, and I'm enjoying that because I'm back in the writer's room. I, 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 I left the writer's room mid-third season uh, to go off and do El Camino, a or, or Breaking Bad movie. And then I, I uh, and, and the show got better and better without me, which is its own kind of hell. On the one hand, it's like, it's, it's, it's you know, people, are like, oh, your show is so good. It's, best, it's the best season yet. Season four was better than season three. And then season five is even better than season four. I like, yeah, well, I had nothing to do with it. Well, okay then, you know, so it, it uh, but now I'm back and they don't need me. I want to hasten to add, but uh, I, I appreciate Peter and the writers letting me back in the room. So we're doing that via, zoom but when i'm not doing that i'm trying to work on this new thing i haven't really told anybody about and it's yeah to answer your question mark it's i'm afraid of the day when it comes to having to show it to the first reader because you know it's just here's my beautiful faberge egg you know and okay bam 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 <laughs> hit it with a big mallet <laughs> so it's, it never gets easier no it never gets easier no ever not ever well, then don't share it. No, but then you're not alive. It's what we're, William and I were just, I mean, if you're not really. No, I know. Are you an artist? I, I, I don't use the word artist, but for the sake of this conversation, are you, are you an artist at that point? If you're not sharing it. And I'd still like to think you are, because if you get, if you derive deep and abiding personal satisfaction, if you go, because I would never want to talk someone into, oh, well, I guess I'm not really doing anything of importance. I'm not saying that. If you draw a pen and ink sketch and you love it and you're so satisfied with it, I don't need to show it to anybody. Or you write a short story or a poem or something and you put them away in a file cabinet to be found five years after your death. It's more power to you. But it's there, you know, for me, it always feels like, uh, you know, you got to, that tree falls in the forest if you write that script or whatever you got it you know you got to show it to somebody but that's the scary part uh, yeah well, it's 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 interesting because it's connected in a way to the whole issue of legacy like what are you going to leave behind right yeah. which is which is very much part of breaking bad just you know that's what what are you going to leave behind it's, it's funny i'll cop to that it's uh I was saying a minute ago, we, I try not to, we try not to think thematically or we don't have an ax to grind or whatever, but that I'll cop to that one. I, I think about that all the time in my life. And that probably did bleed over into, uh, into Walter White, uh, into, into his, uh, into his uh, character, into his personality. Because, you know, when I started, and again, the only episode of Breaking Bad that ever was written by one person, the pilot, I was thinking about, I was about to turn 40 and I was thinking, uh, you know, I've been very lucky. I've been working in TV. I worked on the X-Files. What a great job that was. But that was two years, three years out of, out of I, was, I was off that show uh, for two or three years and not much was going on in my life. And I thought, oh, shit, what if that's the highlight of it all? What if it's all downhill from here and now I'm going to be 40? And then, oh, man. And all of these things I brought to that Breaking Bad pilot and to that character, Walter White. And, and I guess... I'll cop to it. A big part of it was the idea of legacy and what you leave behind. And I was, you know, thank God I had no terminal cancer diagnosis, but that's what you do as a writer. You think, what would it, because I'm a lazy guy, but I have these yearnings to do more. And except I'm kind of not getting out of my chair and doing them, what would potentially kickstart me or put me in an absolute paralyzed funk? And that would be. God forbid, you know, a, a terrible bit of news like like what Walt gets in the in the first act of that pilot. Mm -hmm. Well, despite some of the uh, the darkness that that, <laughs> that does hover uh, in both shows, they're they're just again they they are uh, they're wonderful and they're gifts in a way. 
Um, so we appreciate your, your gifting them to the world. Uh, and Mark, you're shepherding those, those, those gifts uh, uh, out to the, to the public. Um, you know, thank, thank you very much. Um, thank you, William. This has been very heady and flattering stuff. And I, I, just, I, I just, again, I want to thank uh, UVA and, the, and, the, and the, the, the Virginia Film Office and the, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Virginia Film Festival, which is, I guess, uh, Mark, uh, you've been with it since the beginning, the film festival, and it's, and it, it's been, this will be its 32nd year, is that, is that correct? I think that is correct, and I was there. Uh, I was there for the for the very uh, the very first one. It's a it's a team festival. I'm uh, I'm really flattered that I can help, and uh, I think it's you. Know, there are a lot of film festivals around the country, but it's it's you. It's really unique and very uh, has a great audience and an amazing film film appreciation that a lot of festivals don't don't have and of course it's in the beautiful uh, charlottesville setting it, it is well thank you for all the work you've done for it all these years and and thanks to jody kielbasa and the whole crew there and uh, uh william i was this is very flattering and and best to your students and uh thank you and, very uh, much thank you for uh this was a lot of fun very very heady stuff thank you thank, thank you. you all right be well guys take care have, have a